Hi there, this is Steve Hackett and you're listening to the podcast. Hello, prog lovers, and welcome to the podcasts. This time with me, your guest host, Rune. Today we're talking to none other than guitarist and progressive rock legend Steve Hackett. We discuss his newly released album Under a Mediterranean Sky, his long career as a musician and as a member of Genesis and other things. So please enjoy. Thank you very much for for uh, agreeing to talk to us because uh, we're uh, very eager to talk to you about your new album. Congratulations on the release of Under a Mediterranean Sky, which has been out for yeah. a little over two weeks now, right? That's right. Yes, yes, yeah. It's um, it's uh, been a surprising hit album. It's been in the British charts and the German charts and. Uh, um, in the classical charts, um, it went to number two in the classical charts in this country. Um, and, you know, I really didn't design this album to be anything other than to do it for the love of music and the idea of being able to travel virtually on a um, on a record, the idea of an invitation to a journey that no one can and- undertake in reality at the moment. So... Um, the idea of visiting the Mediterranean is something that many of us would like to be able to do once we're out of lockdown and everything. So it's a virtual journey, a substitute journey. In other words, a dream substituted for a reality for people at a time when they are most challenged. Yeah. I, it's interesting that you say that because it mirrors very much a, a question I had sort of, you know, I, I, I wrote here that it it seems to take you on a journey. It's very romantic and dreamlike. So you can really get yes. get lost in it. And, and I was wondering, is this sort of, was this written as a sort of a response to the current situation where most of us are like landlocked a bit? Yes, I think it was. Um, It was my wife who suggested the concept, and she knew that I wanted to do uh, uh, an acoustic album, first of all, uh, because I thought this year I could either do a rock album or an acoustic album, and um, I seemed to be working on everything concurrently, on lots of different things, different styles. Uh, but she was the one who came up with, with the concept and the title and the idea of expanding an acoustic album so it wasn't just um, influenced by uh, endless siestas or uh, the idea of uh, Baroque music in a, in a modern style. But um, instead of just doing a substitution for that, we expanded it to involve harmonic minors and Middle Eastern influence and instruments from... Um, Further away, shall we say, than, than, than the progressive palette. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw you use the expression "radical romanticism" in an interview when you were talking about the yes. album. Would you say? Would you I tell us so. about a little bit about that philosophy, that idea uh, of radical yes, romanticism? I think, it, I think so. I think it's it's giving into your feelings at a time when most people seem to be giving into technology. Uh, the program outweighs the um, the concept most of the time. Uh, people are so keen to to uh, adapt and, uh, and adopt, you know, to the latest uh, rhythm or piece of of of, of, of gear and, and hardware. And and um, when you listen back to albums, you can almost immediately tell when they were made. I find. Mm. Um, whereas I wanted to do something that ignored time and um, allowed itself to be completely escapist, uh, completely romantic. Um, There's no attempt to be modern on this whatsoever, Mm -hmm. and it's complete indulgence on one level, and um, it's the kind of album that could have been made, you know, if the technology had been available. It's the sort of thing that anyone could have done since the 1920s onwards, probably. so, um, yeah, it's an album that could have been written a hundred years ago. Um, I, I just happen to love romantic music, but then I also enjoy the modern interpretation of, of romantic music, which, at, at least in orchestral terms, seems to find its focus with 
film music, yeah. um, film music, orchestral music seems to be modern classical music to me, with, without the need for the um, you know the classical establishment to disappear up its own its own ass. Really, with beats <laughs> and squelches, and 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 to produce music that's completely unlistenable, thereby you know leaving everyone but the academics behind. Exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, also, I think that, that you know, with progressive music, um, uh, my my great friend, the keyboard player um, uh, uh, that I worked with uh, some years ago, was was often saying saying to me, um, Julian Kalbeck. Said, you know, you know, the, the more notes, the less women, and um, showing up to shows. And uh, I suspect it was a case of, you know, the less romance in the music that would be the case. So I wanted to produce something that wasn't. There's was no point doing a pop album. There's no point at my age trying to be a pop star. It's far too late for that. <laughs> um, but you can return to the original idea of being. Um, I don't want to use the word serious musician, you know, because I'm not serious. I'm always cracking jokes and um, playing the clown, frankly. But I know I have this reputation of being serious. Uh, It's just uh, allowing the music to do what it wants to do. And um, sometimes I think, oh, my God, you know, this could have been written, you know, hundreds of years ago, this sort of stuff I'm doing here. But what the hell... It doesn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, I I, 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 uh, I totally know what you mean. And also, it, I I have to say it, it mirrors a lot of my because I've been listening a lot to the album and and I absolutely love it. Yeah. And, and a lot of the music, well, you. like you say, is it it has a this very cinematic feel to it. Like, for instance, the Memory of Myth and the opener yes. Medina. Medina and also this track, yes. uh, Dervish and the Jinn, which I love, you know, with its yes. darker, yes. almost like the soundtrack to a movie. Uh, and you have, of course, yes. written scores before. I, I believe you worked on a documentary, Outwitting Hitler, right? Yes. Yeah, so yes. I'm, I'm, I, wond- I, 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 I'm wondering, could you see yourself yes. doing more work for film and TV? Is that something you'd you'd like to revisit? Um, or? Well, I, I have to say that, that um, it's a bit like being an actor. You know, the actor only gets employed once um, the director or the producer calls him up and says, you know, I've got a script for you. And yeah. so I've had friends who are actors, and I'm, I'm aware that um, very often, you know, for very gifted actors, um, uh, the phone doesn't ring for a very, you know, a, an alarming amount of mm. Time, yeah. out of time. So um, I think that um, most of the stuff that I've done, and lots of it has been used for film music, but it's usually a case of filmmakers using stuff that I've done. Yeah, finding something the they they love and that yeah. resonates yeah, with. They, they, they can find they can find lots of instrumental bits, you know, with my stuff that that, that might suit the film, you know, about anything from. Uh, Training planes, tiger moths, to um, to a, a fishing program on on TV. So, um, uh, but as a service industry to Hollywood, um, I've been a complete failure because um, you know I wasn't pre- I wasn't prepared to go and hang out in Hollywood in the hope that I might get discovered by Cecil B. DeMille. Exactly. Um, yeah. I thought my job was 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 to was to keep going and make lots of. Um, Potential films for the ear, really, and if those uh, films for the ear end up on on the screen in some way, whether it's the small screen or the big screen, then I'm fine with that. And I think probably this album, perhaps more than any other mm. of all the albums I've done, is probably the most cinematic. And um, and probably when I die. Um, it, it, it'll get used, you know, and then no one will have to pay any royalties to the <laughs> composer. So it, it, it'll be an undiscovered country, you know, for for, for either musical archaeologists or um, or, or filmmakers who, well, are, you know, uh, are taking a sort of historical look back and saying, "Well, <laughs> hey, you know, yes, I could use Rachmaninoff, but then again, you know, um, you I know, could maybe use that's been done yeah. and." Yeah, they can use they can use me, so um, I'm I'm quite happy uh, for that to happen because 
I'm making a living doing exactly what I want to do. I mean, yeah. I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky. I joined a great band. I formed several bands that I think were were great. And um, I've currently got a record company who are broad-minded enough to say, whether you do a rock album or an acoustic album, we'll take it. And, yeah. I, and I think this has surprised them. The, I don't think they expected that this album was going to do quite as well as as it has. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's an album that cannot be toured. Um, it's an album that um, I can't do a current tour. I can't do a, a signing session for yeah. it. Um, I can do stuff at home. I mean, this is what I do, of course. You know, I can sign copies at home and, and all that, but the usual sort of round of, of doing what uh. musicians do, which is to show up at your local shop or, or local theatre and uh, do all of that. That's all beyond us at the moment. So um, exactly, especially I'm now. Exa- yeah, exactly what I'm moved to do. Yeah. So, so I, I was thinking, you know, you said this is this album is is impossible to tour, or but because this would be something that I I could imagine, you know, if you were to put it up on the stage, it will be would be something for like a, a select number of shows or something sometime in the future where you can work with an orchestra or something to put this to give this music the you know the sound and the scope it deserves. Yes, I think that. Uh... Um, most of the shows I do these days uh, are rock shows um, but I have worked with an acoustic trio and sometimes we sound a little bit like a chamber orchestra yeah. sometimes that becomes a four piece or a five piece it's very very flexible and sometimes I've just gone out with an acoustic guitar on my own but I, I find that um, although you can do very good business with that I mean it's a case of playing smaller places. Yeah. And um, uh, I basically, once I started doing shows that that were um, half Genesis material and half solo stuff, I I thought, you know, I've, I've, I've established the credentials here and why not go back to the idea of you know, the early stuff that I did with the early band when I was very young and um, and play it with virtuoso musicians who play the balls off the stuff um, and turn in consistently, um, let's put it this way, um, consistent performances of, you know, managing to play the stuff brilliantly Um and, and with a power and, and a certain and a kind of certainty that I wish we'd had in the very early days. It wasn't always possible to do that. You know, when when the original band were doing this, um, the originators, let's put it this way, um, they've really abandoned this stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, they we started off with a with a band that was a kind of a musical think tank, mm. really. Um, cutting edge, not always dealing with certainties, surviving different lead singers, moving on different incarnations of the same band called Genesis. But um, all of that, all of those early experiments that that, that led to, a, to, to a, this kind of inclusive genre that we now call uh, a progressive, um, all of that seems to have been Leading up to Genesis becoming a very successful pop group, exactly, and, yeah. Um, and and um, I think that it was something else that inspired musicians. It was something else that inspired classical musicians, jazz musicians, and those who would become um, inspired by by progressive music. Mm-hmm. And it's the early albums, I think, that, that turned them on to that. So. Um, you know, perhaps we were cast a little bit in the mould of the Beatles in the early days, um, uh, but unfortunately, without the ability of the, of the band to be able to expand and take on board orchestras and, and and all the rest, which which is something that obviously the Beatles were able to do. Like yeah. the, the Beatles became more more interesting once they um, started to work with um, world music and other musicians, and not always. Um, Backing themselves with their own instruments mm. um, 
taking chances and becoming uh, extremely experimental. So um, it seems to have been, you know, the blueprint for much of progressive that was to follow and, and world music that was, um, you know, not really to, to, to get a grip until 20 years after that the Beatles had, had folded. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess it's, um, it's been a long journey. I've been very, very lucky. I've been able to follow my my own my own path and tread, you know, the road less traveled and all of that. Yeah. And you know, to work with percussionists in South America, to work with orchestras all over the world, and um, uh, sometimes live, sometimes uh, sometimes with the Genesis stuff, sometimes you know, purely with the progressive stuff. But um, I didn't expect, you know, my my stuff at this. At the, at the stage I am in the game, and uh, to be making quite such an indentation on on the charts, yeah. so, um, my record company were thrilled with the fact that they happened to be a German record company, and they said it's number fourteen in in the in the um, in the in, in the charts. I in, can imagine uh, that yeah. in Germany, in Germany, you know, and that's the national charts. So um, it's it's funny. You know, I managed to bypass many of the existing channels. Like, exactly, for instance, yeah. we have a, cl- a classical music channel over here on the radio called Classic FM, mm-hmm. and um, they they refused to play this album. Uh, they've played other albums of mine, but for some reason they refused to play this. Mm. But it went to number two in the classical charts in this in this <laughs> country. So um, I seem to have bypassed all the. Um, Existing channels. Yeah, like the choke and points. Uh, yeah, and and getting yeah, out to the, yeah, get, uh, right. getting out to people through other channels. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I've I've, I've not I've, I haven't needed to edit myself. Exactly. Um, there's been something that goes on between myself and my wife, and um, and Roger King, who's involved in the album in a big, big, big way. Yeah, I wanted um, to ask about that so because, the, of course, the, the he's right. It. Yeah. yeah. Because King, of yeah. course, was was yeah. very much involved with the orchestral part of the album, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yeah. Those those orchestral textures, that's all. Um, you know, I, I have a rough idea of it, and I come up with um, uh, chords and top lines. So you know, um, skeleton of skeleton scores for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, we we go at this. If we can use real, we were going to use real musicians for most of it, this kind of thing. But we found that it was too, it wasn't going to be workable. So we worked with a small team. Um, sometimes it was acoustic modelling. Sometimes it was samples. Sometimes it was the man. Sometimes the machine. Sometimes the woman. All of those things. Just keep it all all open and all flexible. And but it's a beautiful sounding record. I think you know for all the attempts at doing something in a classical style that I've I've tried before. I, I find this one the most fresh. And I think the fact that it was done in the space of oh the recording took about two 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 months. Um but I think considering the ambitious nature of the um of the arrangements, I, I think I think we moved quite fast. Um, you know, a rock album takes Usually it takes me about a year to get a rock album together if I want it, you know, if I wanted to have orchestral stuff and musicians from all over the world. It exactly. It does take a while. Well, I, I, you you were mentioning, of course, the, the 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 Genesis revisited, and uh, I, I wanted just to say, you know, we we at the Prog Space here we have our awards for 2020, and I wanted to congratulate you because you're one of the nominees, of course, for best guitarist, but also for the best live album with uh, Selling England by the Pound and Spectral Mornings live at Hammersmith. Oh, yeah, and you released you. you released the first Genesis revisited in '96, I believe. And uh, and I do think you did some sh- yeah you did some shows there right because I think I read somewhere that you did some shows in Japan for that album, but but it didn't really blow up this this Genesis revisited until the second album in 2012. Am I yeah. right to say that? Yep. Uh, yes, absolutely right. Yes, um, um, I think that. Um, 
it was more difficult to mount shows at that time. Um, we did the, a live version of Revisited mm-hmm. um, in in Japan, uh, and th- there's an album from it called The Tokyo Tapes. It's yep. also a DVD which features the late great um, John Wetton. Yes, of course, yeah. And um, Ian MacDonald, who I knew since the early days of King Crimson, we became pals. And uh, Chester Thompson, who I'd worked with with, with Genesis, uh, yeah. With Genesis. Yeah. Uh, and um, Julian Colbeck had done many things with him. Um, it was, you know, very interesting to have that that band together. Mm. And um, um, it, it it was wonderful, but the time wasn't right to be able to take that that team on on the road. Exactly. You know, people had yeah. other concerns and pressures and and uh, and opportunities and commitments um so i ended up leaving it a very long time um i also think that um because genesis had been um an abandoned place mm. for so long um the band that carried on the name ceased functioning after the 1990s basically and didn't yeah. really reconvene until whatever it was 2005 2006 um and um it's a very long time for any band to leave it um and i felt that there was so much that was worth preserving from that time um <clears throat> In fact, in 1973, when we did Selling England by the Pound, um, John Lennon gave an interview in New York and said that Genesis was one of the bands that he was currently listening to. Um, So something must have caught his attention. And um, uh, so for me, having been a Beatles fan, and I know that all the other guys in, in... and Genesis were Beatles fans, of course. Um, you know, that was a very big deal for us. So of course it was, I don't yeah. see why those songs should have been in an abandoned place. So I decided I was going to celebrate that. So you take it right up to the present day, even though, you know, we've been booking tours and shows. And um, um, I'm supposed to be touring at the same time when Genesis are, are touring. Yeah. I, I, it, a year ago, I was supposed to be doing this, and then Genesis booked the their shows at exactly the same time and in the same place. And it looked like we were going to—I was going to be playing in America in April, and then they were going to be playing the UK in April. But obviously, there's a question mark against that because of the pandemic. Of course, now yeah. they've shifted their show to coincide with mine, which has been on on sale. Um, for the autumn of this year. Yeah. Um, so w- once again, my stuff was already on sale. Um, and um, so they will be playing at, at the same time in the same in the same country, you know. Uh, it'll be but yeah, with a, the United but, Kingdom. But, but with quite a different focus, uh, I, I would say, because of course you... So. Yeah, so I think, you, know, you You yeah. are focusing on... on the period you were in the band and of course what a lot yeah. of people refer to as like the the golden age of the the progressive yeah. band genesis so so i'm just wondering when you released genesis revisited yeah. 2 in 2012 that yeah. seemed to to generate an immense interest from fans who wanted to to hear these old uh, yeah. these old albums uh, Performed yeah. uh, were, were were it uh, surprising to you or, or like that beginning? Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. Maybe my instincts have sharpened over time, but um, I was surprised that, that I got a gold album for this. Yeah. Um, um, you know, for songs that were recorded, you know, so long ago. You know, we're talking about fifty years ago. Um, and um yes, I mean it's fifty years ago that I joined Genesis um and started playing with them. Um but there obviously is an audience that is still hungry for that. 
because it works very well live. This kind of music works very well live. Um, and I also think that, that many um, supporters of early Genesis in the 1970s felt that with the change of the band ethos, that they were perhaps disenfranchised. Mm. Um, the people that voted for Genesis in the early days as a band that that, that was challenging musically exactly, and experimental yeah. and yeah. motivated musicians and music lovers, um, that isn't what, what they got later on. That What they got later on was um, something which was a more slick... Uh, pop machine. Yeah, more commercial, and, um, commercially focused uh, band. Sure, and yeah. I'm I'm not criticizing this. Okay, I'm saying that you know that the the, the, produ the production got more slick mm. and uh, and more pre more precise, and I think the production values got 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 better, of course, with time and experience and technology. But the quality of ideas, I think, is mm. something that was unassailable. In the 1970s, when we were um, uh, a five-piece with uh, Peter Gabriel, and um, he's largely responsible for Genesis' success, um, and also I think you know my predecessor, because I'm anxious to um, you know share, let's put it this way, share this. You know, um, my predecessor in Genesis was um, Anthony Phillips, who yeah. was the driving force of that band in in the early. In the, the early days, the first album, yeah, that. and and yeah, and and first album and second album, and and was um, the the um, the main songwriter. So um, I'm, I'm friends with him, and you know we've worked together on on a few things, and uh, he's a very nice guy, very very bright, very very quick. Um, and um, I, yeah, I remember um, I, I read your autobiography uh, a while ago, yeah. and 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 I believe there were, were pictures uh, of you with Anthony from your, yeah. a wedding or something, right? So, That's right. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. He's become a very, very close friend, and um, he, I think, he's a great conceptual thinker, and. Um, again, you know, he's someone who spearheaded Genesis. Exactly. Um, yeah. So um, uh, Genesis is is not one person. Um, I know that um, you know uh, more recent fans tend to think that Genesis is all about um, Phil Collins, but um, I guess it's Genesis in the broadest sense. Exactly. Is well, something well, that's involved like... about. You know, 20 different people. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, I um, guess if you came became aware of the band during like the 80s and 90s, it would be yeah. quite, quite uh, you know, easy to think that, that Phil was sort of the, the, was the band in the way, right? But but if you go back and look yeah. at the origins of the band, you, you, like you say, you can see that there are, that there are, uh, you know, the, the, the full uh, member ro ro roster of the band or whatever, it, it never would have been what it became if it wasn't for that uh, input from all these amazing musicians. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it's it's um it's interesting all of that, isn't it? Um, that uh, everyone played their part, and um, it, it's a very competitive team. Um, yeah, that's the and, impression um, I got that. This was uh, especially during these these uh, albums where you, where you were a big part of the band that you guys were really competing to be to put the best material into the band, right? Uh, yes, that's right. And um, um, I think that you know having a band full of songwriters um, isn't isn't always the easiest. Mm. Um, uh, way to rehearse. Um, I think that you know to to create any any um, really long lasting song, something of any value, um, you really need everyone's cooperation all the time yeah. to be able to do this because the devil is in the detail, of course, and um, uh, a song is only as good as everyone allows it to be. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, it's, it was, I, I joined this songwriters club 
you know, that was already established with two albums. And yeah. um, so it's it's a bit like, you know, you're joining your ideas with everything, with everyone else, but there's a kind of pecking order, a little bit like, yeah. you know, some, some are, are um, uh, either more experienced or... Um, or, or had the you know the power of veto. Yeah. So um, um, it's it's not always easy uh, joining a, someone else's band. Uh, the, the ideal thing is if you can form a band yourself. And um, um, but you know you know how how how, gr- how groups are. Um, I don't think that Bach would have worked in a group. I don't think Tchaikovsky <laughs> would have worked no, in, a, exactly. in a group. Uh, I don't I don't I don't think so. Um, uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, uh, yes, without without all that attention to detail, which is what marks composers whose whose work has survived long after their death. Um, mm. The the work lives on; it, it's it's unassailable. It it sells every 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 year. Tchaikovsky sells out the ballet in in, in London. Certainly, yeah. you know, the Nutcracker goes on and on and on. Um, and um, it's still a winning ticket, and it it can only be the the power of the ideas that that does that. So Tchaikovsky is the ballet, you know, as Puccini is the opera. Mm. Um, somehow those monopolies were were set up uh, very very early on. I, I I wanted to. You mentioned something about the competitiveness of the band, and you know how mm. how challenging it can be when you are so many songwriters and talented songwriters in the band and and I, I was thinking about um, your first solo album Voyage of the Acolyte that's 1975 yeah. and and yes. you, of course you have a, a very long string of, of very good solo albums I, I think I counted 26 albums if we include the, your classical albums and Blues with a Feeling uh, so I I was saying I, I believe I read that some of the stuff on on Voyage Voyage of the Acolyte, like uh, the fantastic shadow of the Hierophant, was sort of meant for Genesis, or at least like uh, uh, shown to the rest of the band as yeah. a, an yeah. idea for something yeah. you could have done, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, um, it was a Genesis reject. Um, yeah, the idea first appeared in 1972, and um, um, it looked like Genesis were never going to use that. Mm. Um, you know, three years on a back burner is a is a very long time for something to sit around. Um, and we, yes, really, it's the outstanding track on that on that album. Um, and I think um, after I did it, um, Tony. Banks said we could have used that for Genesis, <laughs> and well, yeah, well, I really... thought, well, it could be, it could be a very, it could be a long wait if that was the case. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, I think um, there, there you ended up uh, playing on on your first album with Sally Oldfield, right, on on Shadow of the yeah. Hierophant, and also your yeah. that's the first time you had your brother involved, John. Uh, yes. And yes. So. Yeah. I personally I think maybe it turned out for the better because the album is absolutely fantastic maybe maybe you one of my favorite uh of your your solo albums Yes I well at the time when I did it I I was very inexperienced as a um as a producer um and um that stuff was some of it was recorded, you know, at three in the morning um, with a team that were learning it on the spot. So um, it was recorded in very difficult circumstances. But, you know, I, I, I was very young and so was the team. Yeah. And so we, we weren't getting much sleep putting that stuff together. Um, but um, I fell in love with um, the process of being being a band leader. Yeah. At that time, um, and uh, John and I—it was my brother's debut professionally as well—and he sounded so stunning on it. Um, it was really what convinced him to switch from st- 
studying at university uh, languages because he was already at Cambridge studying languages and he decided to switch to music. Yeah. Uh, I think he made made the right choice, but then um, it was something that, uh, yes, he was already, you know, a, a, a stunning player at, at that at that point. And um, he, he went on, you know, uh, taking music lessons and, and, and everything. Um, whereas, of course, I just... Um, felt that uh, to be instinctive was the best thing and um, I, th- I think it's been the best thing for me so I always aspired towards um, doing things that, that other musicians who were schooled could do much better than me you know they they were able to read music and score for orchestras and all this kind of stuff but I thought if I do this it's going to dampen my enthusiasm I, I'll end up Doing something, I'll be following someone else's path, and yeah. um, I thought the way to be an all-rounder was to um, ignore all of that, yeah. and to not be part of the academy, and to be criticised. And um, yeah, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to go back to school. I also wonder. I also yeah. wonder because, of course, you are an you are a immensely skilled gu- guitarist, and I wonder if you had gone that route, if we if you we would have had some lo- of that like pioneering, like the tapping technique that you used on some of the early Genesis albums. Is that yes. did that come about from your own experimentation, right? Not not being part of a, a, a class or something. Yes. Um, that that at the time was my idea. Um, uh, whether I'm the inventor of it or whether it's other people, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, many people say they were doing it but not recording it. Um, uh, I was certainly doing it with an electric guitar. I haven't found anyone else who was doing it. No, and neither, then, neither, but, neither yeah, have, yeah. I, have I. Yeah. <laughs> I've never. I've, yeah, it's yeah, the I early, earliest I can find uh, of, on an album yeah. of someone using these techniques, really. Yeah, it, well, it was a way of playing uh, very, very fast on one string, basically, um, and then you could change strings without um, using a, a plectrum. Um, so it's a little bit closer to the to the keyboard. Fretboard and keyboard come together with tapping. Um, and um, that's right. I mean, at that time, there wasn't a school for tapping. No. Um, I'm quite sure now, if you... Um, uh, there's an American rock school, isn't it? MIT. Um, yeah. I'm sure they teach that. I'm sure. I'm sure it's on the curriculum. It's on the curriculum now, but not... Not then, no, and so exactly. um, you. I think you pay a, a certain price for making your own mistakes, um, inventing your own techniques. Um, if if it's fear that holds you back from going the the traditional route, then um, you won't be alone. Um, I. As I say, I didn't. For me, uh, g- g- learning guitar was an alternative to to being taught things at school. Where um, I, I was tired of what tended to happen at school, where even if you did something perfectly, um, you wouldn't necessarily um, um, get great marks for it. Mm. I, I learned this very early on. You know, when when they had a, at my primary school when we were very young learning to do italic writing and uh, <laughs> we spent all afternoon every year Practicing. learning to do this and and I had the handwriting of a calligrapher at that time you know I wish I, I had to employ people to write as well as I could when I was 10 years old mm. but um, um, but I, I never got a prize for it you know at the end of the year <laughs> <laughs> And, exactly, and, yeah. and without that encouragement, you know, even calligraphers, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, um, okay. You well, need that, to have I, some. That, that, yeah. 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 You know, so, um, 
Well, I well, just felt that the world, the, the world of academia, was like that, and uh, I, I so I was always suspicious of school and everything that that went with it. And um, I, I left school very early when I was sixteen years old. And in those days, you could leave school when you were fifteen. Yeah. Uh, in England, and now you can't be scored until you're 18, and of course, a lot of kids, you know, really yeah. are not suited to school, so uh, what's the point of being shouted at when you're an 18-year-old, when you, you just think, oh, fuck off, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, I, I think it's a bad idea for, for kids to be stuck at school that long. Um uh, get out there, get a job, get the hell out. You know, that was the thing. So I, I had a number of jobs when I left school, uh, you know, five years of jobs until I, I joined Genesis. Um, uh, lots of advertising in the back pages of a famous musical paper that no longer exists. <laughs> so no one no one can go that route yeah, anymore. I read, I read about um, that, uh, trying to yeah. find like-minded musicians, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, like-minded musicians and appealing to um, the idealists, perhaps, yeah. um, which you could do at, at that time. I'm not sure that's really possible now. Um, you know, I mean, if I'd have been born uh, a few years later, perhaps I would have been happy to join a, a punk band. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah. And, then, and then no one will be taking me seriously when I say, you know, I've written a symphony. <laughs> ah, you know, yeah, sure, sure, forget it. You know, so, um, but but uh, sort of moving moving up to current day again a bit, because uh, I, I yeah. think I read somewhere that, that your next tour will be, or, or you had a plan at least to, to focus on seconds out. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So is that something Second that you're and, that you're and, still preparing and, and, and solo stuff as well? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll do that, but also um, uh, solo stuff as well. So I'll do two sets, you know, of 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 of, of each. So yeah. um, uh, that's the plan anyway. At the moment, uh, nobody really knows com com with complete certainty. Uh, because of we're still in the midst the pandemic, of, yeah. of, of a pandemic yeah. and a slow rollout of vaccines, and um, I hope to be doing shows this year. That's all I can say is I hope to be doing shows this year. And yeah. of course, we got the tragedy of Brexit, which um, um, is yeah. something that uh, that was that um, was actually also something I, I I wanted to ask you about because. Yeah. I recently yeah, read them. Nothing to do with me. Yeah. I, was, I was firmly against Brexit. <laughs> I think it's a terrible idea. Yeah. And, and everyone's finding out that, um, yeah. yeah so, um, I read a, a very informative post by Fish, you know, of, of previously of Marillion, which, which yeah. career sort of mirrors your, in a way, you know, being part of a successful band for some of their, their most, you know, golden uh era and then striking into his solo yep. career and he wrote a very interesting yep. article on on UK yep. musicians and what you must face now in regards to Brexit so yep. so I'm I'm guessing yeah. it, it is a challenge this this uh, situation for you it's a, it, yeah we have two challenges we have the challenge of of the pandemic and the um and the and the problem of Brexit and um I mean, I understand that Europe is very angry with with Britain, and um, um, I gather that you know it, it it won't it won't be surprising if they try and make it as difficult as possible for the British musicians to uh, uh, to tour in Europe. And um, uh, I hope that that some reciprocal situation is arrived at. But uh, at yeah. the moment, the British uh, politicians are unwilling. To do this, um, and um, and so they're basically, you know, fucking it up for for the rest mm. of us and for every young band that wants to get out there and tour internationally. That, that and seems very killing, yeah. killing music, killing music stone dead. And so um, you've got to be very successful indeed to be able to survive um, all of the inherent problems of separate visas and withholding tax and. All of all of the bullshit that goes with this. Um, I've been investing in Europe for fifty years as a yeah. touring musician. I, I think I have something that uh, that 
would be would be good for me to to end on on a more on, on a more positive note because of course and sure. like you talked about unlike some of the other genesis members they moved in directions with pop music or like gabriel yeah. world music you seem to be very yeah. happy to be a part of this progressive music scene like for instance you played yeah. festivals like the prog my friend in barcelona where you went on stage yeah. with a lot of young progressive musicians I was just sure. wondering, how do you view uh, progressive music's place today versus when you started out in the 70s? And what's your thoughts on the current state of progressive music? Um, well, funny enough, I'm just doing some sleeve notes um, for Jonas Reingold uh, with Car Mechanic. Oh, um, and, uh, fantastic band. And I find it, yes, I find it very interesting that... Um, um, the, the second wave of progressive stuff. I think it's a given. It's a bit like classical music. It's a given that you work with virtuoso musicians because that's the only thing that really works with with progressive stuff. So you have to have guys who are conversant with different styles of music. Um, I think that progressive is the most inclusive form. Uh, it's music without prejudice. Um, other than that, um, the best of it um, is something that that's with us, whether you, whether you like it or not. It yeah. is a genre that has survived. It nearly died a death at one point in the nineteen eighties. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but um, ha- as a revived form um, that includes every other form, um, it is what you make it. Mm. Um, bands like Elbow and um, uh, uh, Muse and uh, and, and, and a, a whole, Mechanic and a whole lot of you know uh, metal musicians also being very inspired yes. by you <laughs> originators yes. from the seventies, right? Well, th- there's no reason why heavy metal shouldn't be um, uh, involved with progressive, um, you know, progressive metal. Um, it doesn't really. Uh, there, if there's no prejudice, then there's no need to conform to any one or subscribe to any one club. Um, um, it's a bit like dance music, you know, dance music. So many musicians trying to do dance music, but it, yeah. it's an oversubscribed club. It's there are so many people competing in that area. Um, I think it's better to work in a in a in a smaller area, and um, and try and be the best in that in that area, um, and allow yourself to experiment, allow yourself to fail, um, um, but to, to be true to your ideals is really where I came came on board. Um, I don't mind any any kind of music as long as it's really really good. Yeah. Um, that's that's the whole point. So um, you can work in any any area. I think that's a fantastic way to end it. <laughs> uh, so thank you thank so you. much, uh, uh, Steve, for ta- talking to us and uh, all the thank best. Thank you so things. much. The Progcast is a production of Stuus Media and is presented by the Prog Space. It is produced by Randy M. Salo, Janine Stengel Lewis, Blake Lewis and Dario Albrecht. Our theme music is by This Is Not An Elephant, and Van Kirsch does our graphics. New episodes of the podcast drop every Monday and Thursday. And don't miss our Friday Top 5 episode where we discuss our favorite new releases from that week. For more interviews and reviews in the written form, check out theprogspace.com.